we are broadcasting, and believe it or not, <laughs> it is already November. Oh my God. November 3rd. Uh, it's a glorious day in paradise. It is truly raining here. It's already rained like two inches. Um, what a what a beautiful day, anyways, because it is a it is a calm beginning of fall. The leaves are falling, and here comes Christmas. Ho 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 ho. And um, John Butler, take us in a little a little swagger of music. Yeah. Where where are you gonna take us? Pass a sprinkler with the blues. I got a few old dreams that I can't use. Who will buy my memories? Things that used to be. Beautiful. Thank you, sir. How are you, John? I'm just doing fine. I had a great class this morning. It was raining. And of course, giving out different modes. Uh, a lot of kids uh, were saying, can we do Zoom today? So therefore, we're in a whole different kind of uh, expectations. It's raining in Austin, Texas, and we needed to rain. It rained real hard for a real long time. And six feet of water in the streets of Evangeline, as we say in the great state of Louisiana. Other than that, it's a lot of stuff going on. I got a lot of calls this morning about an election in Virginia. I thought that was pretty interesting. And other than that, I am uh, in the great state of Texas in the city of Austin, a growing right. metropolis. All right, all right. Llewellyn King, how are you, sir? I am quite fabulous, but you know that. <laughs> <laughs> you, look, you look incredibly charming today. It's, uh... well, I, I've just been doing a two-hour uh, chairing a session for your friend, uh, <clears throat> Peter Londro and 400 uh, 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 public power entities. Very interesting. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Excellent, excellent. We have a great guest today. Uh, it's an old friend, Dave Albano from AT&T. How are you, sir? I'm doing great, Andres. Doing great. Yeah, uh, Dave, Dave, is in the, Dave is in the reigning capital of the World Series, the Atrana Braves. <laughs> Look at it, he's smiling. <laughs> I've, I've lived here in Atlanta for uh, 18 years as of October 31st, and uh, it's the first title we've ever brought home. So it's, there you uh, go. Yeah, it's, it's, been, it's been 26 years or something like that, right? So, yeah. so that was a, that was quite a series. You know, unfortunately, I was rooting for the wrong team, but uh, <laughs> but it was it was pretty spectacular. It was a very nice, a, very, a lot of great pitching and. Great offense at the right time. It was beautiful. Great games. Good series. So, it's nice, to, nice to see the young players coming on. So it's absolutely, good. absolutely. So before we get rolling, uh, you know, <clears throat> for those of you that are chiming in and, you know, the peanut gallery is growing pretty fast here. Uh, Dave Albano is the president and CEO of Restore Point. And, <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> Dave, uh, it's really a, long time AT&T executive that eventually turned into a private equity guy and decided to uh, change the world. Uh, and we're gonna hear about what he's doing with that. Um, Restore Point is quite an interesting company in the AI cloud data and process automation space. Uh, <clears throat> Dave holds a BA in mathematics from his university. Maybe he knows a few things about statistics and, uh, and things like that. And he happens to have an MBA from Nova Southeastern University and an international business executive certificate from Columbia University. Welcome, Dave. Thanks, Andres. Appreciate it. Absolutely. So, uh, gentlemen, you know, I, I'm always curious to where things are going to go. And the notion of um, <clears throat> where we are today with, um, you know, the economy and things. So I'm curious, Dave, you run what I would call a small, medium-sized company. Uh, you sell to enterprises, uh, some pretty unique services about digitalization. We have been saying in this uh, program for a long time that COVID 
has been a big accelerator of digitalization strategies and actions. And um, we're wondering from your point of view, <clears throat> give us a, a sense of um, the impact of COVID in your business the last 12 months and what, you know, are, is business up or down, the economy, things are looking great or not? Uh, give us a sense of where you are at. How do you see this? Yeah, so so it's been interesting. With COVID, the first thing that happened is, is we all went home, right, to work from home. So, uh, and actually, we were pretty, I would say we were pretty early on. So we got rid of our office quite, quite quickly last summer. Um, we decided that working from home for us was actually more productive, although we spend probably five hours a day on video, maybe five, six hours a day on video. Um, and that's how we collaborate now. So rather than walking down the hall in the office, right, we're, we're more scheduled in a, in a video environment. Um, from a business perspective, you know, I think um, the PPP loans helped, right? And so we're, we're an employee-based company, right? And so um, we're, we're a lot of data engineers, so we've got a hefty payroll from that perspective. And so PPP loans helped us get through the crunch. Um, what I saw last year was a lot of our project work had declined right, in the data space because as people went home, they were focused on you know, getting back online from home and doing the things they needed to from a, from a technology perspective. Um, but as we entered this year, what I see is a lot of companies now trying to automate right? And also try to figure out what are my employees doing when I can't see them, right? And so, so automation is, has become a big piece of, um, big piece of our business, right? So we're, we're a data curator, I'll call it, right? So what we do is, is we take data from all disparate data sources and we help companies put that into a platform so that they can then analyze it and really take action against it. And it's that latter part, right? That automation piece, that take action against it, um, those business outcomes that we're seeing a lot of growth in, right? And whether that's robotic process automation or whether that's, you know, feeding things that happen to be done manually in the past, um, people are trying to reduce the number of employees they have, right? That are doing just, I would say, uh, manual tasks that can be repetitive right. and replacing those with computers, right? And then being able to elevate their employees to do more meaningful tasks. So, 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 so help us understand before we dive into a, an incredible amount of questions here. Help <laughs> us understand, give us a profile of your customer. What's what, you know, it could be any company, but, you know, what does that conversation look like? Who is, you know, is it, is it the Burger King guy? Is it the small security is, you know, insurance guy? Is it the small manufacturing guy? Who is, who is basically saying, I need that and I want to change my company and I want to get better? Yeah, I think, you know, where we see a lot of, um, where we've seen a lot of competition, right, is the Accentures of the world dealing with the big companies. Mm -hmm. What we're trying to do is take what they're doing for big companies and bring it down to the middle market enterprise level customer, right? So get underneath those Fortune 500, then on next level of company down, that's not going to spend a gazillion dollars on consulting, right? Um, to, for people to come in and tell them how to manage their data. And so that next tier is kind of underserved in this market, right? And so what we, what we do is, so healthcare is a big, you know, is a big sector for us. So we're doing a lot in healthcare. Um, and what's happening is, is they're rolling up these companies, right? So healthcare is getting rolled up all across the U.S., whether it's doctors, eye doctors, physical therapists, it doesn't matter what it is, but we're seeing a huge roll up. Where we come in is, is we've got a platform to take those disparate systems and rather than these private equity companies trying to standardize all the systems, they're using us as a middleware that says, let me take all those disparate systems, move them into one view so that I can get all of the um, KPIs and things that I need to to run my business. And so that's been that's been a big area. So so companies that are um, that are that are privately held or invested in with PE firms has been a big target market for us. And that's where we're finding the a lot of lift right now. Yeah, Dave, I have a question. I was working with one of the interesting thing about compliance is there were a lot of compliance manuals around. <clears throat> I was working with a company from Houston, uh, direct line to compliance. I think they also are part of Andre's group. And what they were trying to do was ask answer a question mathematically from all of the existing or prior existing manuals. They were able to color code the manuals, change those colors into algorithms, and then they can tell exactly the percentage 
of compliance that you are while you're sitting in the board meeting. So if I'm sitting in the board meeting in the old days, they would say, okay, we're running a railroad. Are we compliant with everything? And somebody said, well, I think so. But I think direct line to compliance would say the following. Give me everything that you have. We're going to color code everything. And we're going to change that to algorithm. And I can tell you if you're 90% compliant, 95% compliant, or 100% compliant. Do you have that technology on your platform there at, at Restore Point? Yeah, I mean, yes. I mean, so... I mean, from a compliance standpoint or just in general, the ability to to run those algorithms is so typically, you know, for us is to get the data in. What we do is we we model the data in such a way that you can query data. Right. And so that's one of the unique things that we do. Right. So a lot of people say, dump all the data in here. Right. And I'm going to give you the answers. And what we do is, is we curate the data such that we put it in a model where you can query the data like Google. So I can begin to ask the questions, right, um, through the data. And what we're trying to do is make it self-service so that companies don't come to us to build dashboards or to answer the questions for them. That, but we create the data in such a way that they can answer the questions themselves, right, and run those algorithms themselves. And so we have some R, you know, import capability where you can, you know, ingest those algorithms or we write those algorithms as part of our data cleansing um, environment, right, when we clean the data and prepare it. Yeah, so, so for example, if, if I'm at a beverage company and I send you a lot of data, and of course what you do, you do a lot of correlations yeah. and see what's going on with what's going on. And then if I want to run, I don't know, a regression or whatever to find a different answer, then I can find that question from the data. But if I want to know, okay, what's the probability of somebody who's living in Atlanta, Georgia, purchasing my product, which is a beverage, then you can take all of the data that they have and, and, and look at the uh, probabilities, which become probabilities, and then look like look at the correlations and say, okay, you can answer this question and you can actually find out where your customers are, where they live, and what's the probability of them buying your, your yeah. product. Yeah. Okay. And we're not doing as much predictive, <laughs> right? So the future will be the predictive nature of what we're doing versus the you know, just to be able to, to get it from the data right now. The question is, how do you take it to the next level and become that much more predictive, right, in the future or adaptive, right? Well, that's good because my company needs a theory about where we're going. We need our own vision of where we're going. And then we utilize the data that we send you to really, really compound that vision with, with numbers. With facts. With facts, yes. Yeah. Yeah. To take the emotion out that's right. of the decision-making. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, my, my uh, Llewellyn King... Uh, Sometimes I like to make uh, decisions with emotions. Uh, he's one of my great colleagues in the world. And, uh, you know, with the exceptions of some of the Greek philosophers, I, I haven't found out how to, uh, to turn emotions into algorithms. But I can say this. I think that as we look at the algorithms, even though we have all the numbers, the vision must be in place also. Yeah. You know, it's like when, you know, what we do when we, when we have the algorithm for airplanes, we take the emotions out of human decisions. But yeah. somewhere along, the, somebody has to say, this is the right theory and this is the right place that we're on. So you're in a great, great space uh, for, for the movement of big data. And I have one other question. Is there a security privatization around the data? Or do you get it from the big data sources? Do you worry yeah. about privacy? Does it come in with no names and no... How do you do that? Uh, so in, in our prior business, we used to be a data backup company, right? That was the original foundation of, of uh -huh. the store point. The data was always encrypted in motion and at rest, right? And so you really never right. saw that. I could see the metadata, but I, I could never see the data itself. In this world, we don't encrypt and decrypt data, right, all day long. And so, so no, this is actually live data that sits in our system. And since, you know, the, the pillars of restore point are we do data backups yet. We do disaster recovery. We're a cybersecurity company based on Palo Alto Networks. We're one of their, their 12 managed security uh, providers in North America. And then we have our, our, our plasma platform, which does the data analytics and automation. So those are so everything we do is around data. Um, we surround our platform with Palo Alto Networks, um, and our customers come into a private networking environment to, to manage and view that data, right? And so, so everything is done. Um, in a private networking environment. We do back it up into Snowflake, which is in the cloud. And in an emergency, then we can spin up resources in the Snowflake cloud, right? And we can run a secondary version of it there, you know, almost as a digital copy or a digital twin, if you want to think of it that way. Um, 
Dave, I don't have the superb erudition of John Sibley Butler, so I have to ask rather simplistic questions. How sure are you of the data? Is there bias in the data? And can you detect if there is? Yeah, I think, you know, data validate. So one of our methodologies for data validation is, is when we onboard clients, right? And so we do actually, almost like we do in software development, what we call a weekly sprint with data, um, which is interesting. And so what happens is, is we load data in very quickly when a customer gives us a data source and we begin to visualize it. And then what we do is we work with the customer to validate that data week over week over week. Once that becomes a trusted source and they sign off that, hey, this thing matches, right, everything that we're doing, um, then we know the source of the data is correct, right? And we've got it, we've got it modeled the correct way. And so that usually takes about three, four weeks to work with the customer in that iterative process to get this, to get the data source correct. Now, once the data is in there, and as you begin to analyze it and do statistics, we all know that you can, right, you can try to get you know, statistics will tell you what you want them to tell you, at, you know, at any time, but um, this is really the source of truth. So um, we, what we find is most customers spend an inordinate amount of time validating their data in today's world where they have Excel spreadsheets, right? And, and it's different departments trying to say, my data, my data is better than your data, right? Or it's more accurate than your data. What this really becomes is the source of truth for a company so that they can make their decisions based on that. Right. And, um, you know, is if they kind of push it out from there and try to do statistics or analyze it beyond that point, well, then they can manipulate it from there. Right. But we are we sure in that- danger? Are we in danger, Dave, of becoming uh, data slaves, enslaved by our data, depending on all our decisions on data and therefore removing human imagination from our calculations and therefore from our progress? Yeah, and I think it goes back to what John was talking about. When you get into the predictive and the adaptive piece, there's a human element there, right? That I think becomes more, you know, more involved. I think the basic underlying data to react to things that are happening or even be proactive around things that are happening, I think it's a great source for that. But as you get into the AI aspect of it, right? I think that's where um, you need a human element. I mean, yes, the computers can tell you, but the humans are programming that in that logic into those into those computers. So I think data will be a much bigger, it will be much more involved in our decision making, right, than our gut feel that we use today, right? But I don't know that we'll become slaves to it. I mean, I think the human element. There's still there's still things that the data is not going to tell us, right, that we know from other factors outside of that data. It's always been a limitation, Dave, of market research, that it can only research that which the the imagination of the people being questioned can reach. Ergo, so if you went and said, I'm going to build a little phone that you can do all your banking on and will be quite incredible, would you buy it? People wouldn't even believe it, let alone would they buy it. Uh, In publishing, we constantly have this uh, illustration before us that people don't know what they want till we give it to them. Sometimes we get it right and we make money, and sometimes we get it wrong and we don't make any money. Uh, did we know that we would <laughs> that we would need uh, computer dating? Most people would probably have said, "Oh no, I meet people at the bar or at work. I've never heard of anybody meeting a stranger and it working out." It's now a huge industry. So you've always got that that leap. It's sort of as there is in philosophy, the leap of faith, the gap. Uh, and uh, I wonder where the gap is between data and where we're really going to go. It, yeah, it'll, it doesn't tell us everything. And I agree with you, right? There's many things that have happened, right? That, that if we would have predicted, I would have said, there's no way to, right? I mean, I see it, all, you know, you see it every day. Right. If, if even COVID, right? Think about COVID for a minute. Like, if could any of us predicted what the outcome of COVID would have been, um, or that even it would happen? So, a pandemic is nothing new, right? We've been planning for pandemics. It's been a topic of discussion. And then when it really hit, the outcomes and even just the actions of people, the movement of people, the housing, the crisis of supply chain, right? There, for me, it was very unpredictable to see some of those things or just the magnitude, right, of the impact of those things. Um, 
has been astonishing for me, right? Even a year and a half year later, right? It's just been, it's been very interesting that supply chain is probably the biggest one right now that we're all starting to feel, right? And inflation now is the next piece, right? That we're beginning to feel. I think what it does, it gives us a lens. As, as one who spent my life swimming in data sets, I can remember when the census data hmm. was the best data that we had. And then we have qualitative data where people go out and observe. But it certainly gives us a, a different lens of, of how to look at problems in the world. So right now, for example, all of my data sets, I just, I scrape them from the, from the web. I mean, I might go to LinkedIn, I might scrape... Uh, uh, data uh, and create data sets. So Llewellyn, when you open a door, that's a data set to me. When you when you turn on your radio, that's a data set to me. When you turn on your television or your computer, it's all data to me. And that's what makes smart cities so interesting. There will be so much data that we have, we, we still have to guess because we need an idea or a guess, or as we see in academia, a theory about why people do what they do when they purchase our products and who will purchase our products. And that's the predictive element. But as Llewellyn said, at the end of the day, when all of the data are on the table, someone has to make the human decision. And by the way, as in finance, if you don't make the right decision with all the data, Mr. and Mrs. CEO, you are fired. So what we do, uh, Llewellyn, is why did the bridge fall? Well, let's look at the data. Uh, what do we know about forest fires? Let's look at the data. So the more data we have, the, the more we can re-engineer the social processes, and more importantly, the business processes in the world. And yet, and I agree. I agree with you, John, and you stated that extraordinarily well. Um, but you still have the unpredictability, as Dave said, about who could predict the impact of COVID. Uh, and some of those impacts were are not to do with the disease directly, but so many people working from home, for example. And somehow the, the, the supply chain problem and the attendant uh, inflation have snuck on us. We hadn't, didn't have a lot of warning of it, uh, uh, which one is, would assume data would have told us that this was coming. I mean, there was an awful lot of data about the supply chain and somehow we got no advance warning of this crisis. Well, I think we did in terms of the predictability and the networking of how the virus would move. So we had predictability that the virus was spread to this many people and the virus was spread in this way. But it was it was based on a different kind of assumption. The uncertainty, which is not the things we cannot predict, the uncertainty is what are the unintended consequences of the virus? What would a work what would the workplace look like? So for example, I just got an email from a student who said, well, Dr. Butler, it is raining. May I join the class on Zoom this afternoon? <laughs> I would have never predicted that three years ago, that a student would say, I don't want to come to your class, but I know that there is Zoom available. Can you please put me on Zoom independently? So those are uncertainty, yes. Yeah. Dave, uh, real quick, uh, you know, in this, in this program, we track sort of these big mega trends around digitalization, decentralization, decarbonization. And then we focus on uh, smart cities, smart utilities, smart energy, smart building, uh, and telecommunications and internet of things. Clearly you, you live in a world that requires broadband. So I would imagine, and obviously your, your background as an AT&T executive, that you, you see 5G, and Wi-Fi six and seven as as fundamental pieces of the of the solution and enablers of a much larger set of data. It's even though you you know you're in the you're in the you're in the data center of the co in the company, you you want in just data for more places. Tell us, tell us a little bit about what is that? Ha what's happening with? broadband pushing to the edge and how is that changing if any how much data you're ingesting and, and what does that look like i think i mean i think we'll for sure the data is going to push to the edge right and i think compute will push to the edge with it right because um, probably the biggest challenge around data is moving it 
right? And so moving massive around amounts of data is just, it, it's, it's something that I, I can't wait to it goes, it gets reduced, right? And so moving compute to the edge is gonna be a big differentiator. And, and that's gonna change a lot of things because today, you know, computes either in the cloud, right? So it's in these centralized data warehouses or in centralized data centers. Mm -hmm. And now all of a sudden, and those are all conditioned and right. So, you know, you can control those environments. And as we push it to the edge, it almost feels like you're going to push it back into a server closet, right? And so, so the question is, is, you know, as we push more computing to the edge, will it be in conditioned facilities and will it be as efficient, right, as having it in a centralized location where today we can cool it and, and take care of things? And so we definitely see that pattern going out there, but we also think, see sensors everywhere, just in a building, right? The sensors, like we're pre COVID, I did a, um, Car Properties is one of our, our big clients and they let us use them as a reference and they actually let us display their data as a reference. And it's very interesting. They were embarking on a tenant satisfaction within their buildings. They have 17 portfolio properties, big skyscrapers, right in DC and Boston, et cetera. And they were trying to do tenant satisfaction. So they were censoring the building to see which amenities people were using in their buildings. That was their use case. And when COVID hit, it became the same data set but it wasn't to see what amenities people were using in their buildings. It was around what was the air quality in the building, which doors were they coming in in the building, where were people going in the building so they can clean them, so they can make sure, right, all of these things were taken care of. But I, I saw the biggest thing out of it was air quality. And then the other thing that they're doing is, is just their, we take um, feeds from like, it's called utility API. So we can get all their utility bills and bring them in. And all of a sudden now they can see across their properties where it's efficient, where it's not efficient. And so I'm watching them use the data in a much different way than they were just to do tenant satisfaction, right? Now it became air quality. It became resources around utilities, especially as utility prices are skyrocketing right now. Mm -hmm. um, it became cleaning the building. And yes, we're still looking at the amenities, but now what it is is us feeding their maintenance systems, right? When an issue happens or the air quality goes down, a maintenance ticket gets popped. There's the data automation piece, right? And it's feeding them in an automated way within that building. But there's all sensors in that building. They tried to run all those sensors over Wi-Fi today. And what people are starting to figure out is, is they should be separating their OT networks from their IT networks. And we're starting to see more of that go on to the cellular network now. And it might be sensors talking to other sensors and that gets aggregated before it goes out, right? But just the, the um, combating the Wi-Fi between the IT and the other departments has been a big issue. And it also creates a security exposure. And mm -hmm. so I'm actually watching real time as this is changing over the last year, as things are moving from, from regular network or Wi-Fi network over to the, to the 5G network. Yeah. So it's interesting, just in just that one example, right, how it's changed in the last 18 months. Absolutely. I think that's terribly important. Um, yeah, probably has been too much emphasis on IT and not enough across the industrial board on OT. And uh, some redress of that is, I think, timely. Yes, especially with, the, with elevators and everything that's in the building and the OT networks. It, I mean, it just makes us much more, excuse me, Noel, efficient. <laughs> uh, John, John is a believer in efficiency. I am a believer in chaos, largely <laughs> stemming from my own conduct. <laughs> so, so Dave, Dave, when it comes to come to some of these big impacts, clearly, you know, you you just gave us a great example of somebody changing. What what about what about what do you see if anything changing around the notion of smart cities or perhaps that's too big uh just just think about electrification of transport of transportation electric vehicles or or think about something like blockchain i mean right, where, where do you see where do you see the next wave of, of digitalization hitting us hard it's interesting, like the electric vehicles, when, when you really think about those as an example, is their sensors running down the network, down the highway, right? Like if you look at a Tesla, that thing has more, they're collecting more data 
than any other company that I know, right? And they're using it for all different things, right? And it's really to drive that automated car, right? To the self-automation of cars. So um, the car actually itself is a sensor, right? And I think that that's, that's remarkable, right? And it, and eventually the cars will talk to other cars as we all know, right? And they'll probably be able to talk to sensors that are on the roadways, right? And so I think that's gonna be a big change that we don't have today. And we see it with street lights and other things, right? But I think there's a lot that can be done in, in that world alone, right? Where it can reduce the number of accidents um, and weather conditions, all of those things, right? Can be detected Mm-hmm. And, and communicate it into a vehicle before you even arrive on that scene, right? And so, so I see a lot of change going in, in that direction um, with self-driving cars. That's going to be a big one as we move forward. Yeah. I think um, so. And I think the biggest thing around all of that is, is not only how technology would change, but how who's responsible would change. That is, when the automobile hits something, when there's an accident, when it hits something. And we will have in court all of the sensors. You're exactly right. The Tesla is a sensor, just as an airplane is now a sensor. Yeah. Uh, as 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 we like to say, when you when you get on an airplane, what do we call the pilot? Well, we call the pilot a passenger now, uh, because they are just looking at and, and and watching all the sensors. But you're exactly right. And and then people themselves, as we walk around with cell phones, we are sensors too. Right. Yeah. So, so, so if you look at the research on what I call social physics, where they use cell phone data, credit card data, all the data that's hooked to us, the data is so tremendous, we can actually predict the movement of people better than we can predict the movement of stars in the universe that physicists have done. So just as the, the, the Tesla is a sensor, you are also a sensor if you have your cell phone. Oh yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. And it's got a location indicator on it, right? And so, yes, right. so you know, you know, companies are trying to figure out is I go to a website, right? And you look something up. So I was talking to a community that was doing this. So think of a you know, chamber of commerce, right? So I go to the website, I look up something, and then I arrive in that community. I can tell you there because of yourself. Like, like people are trying to figure out, right? If, if I do this, right, does it lead to that, right? And, and the data can tell you that, and these sensors can tell you that. And it doesn't have to be precise, right? It's just the fact that you're in that city now. Right. Yeah. And so so what sensor in that city is going to indicate that you actually looked at a website to look up something in Virginia. Right. And then I ended up in that town in Virginia. Right. Right. And again, it doesn't have to be precise, but there is actually a lot of data that's being collected around that right now. Right. Of how Absolutely. More people to my location. Absolutely. So when there is a bombing in X city and the FBI asks you know, the social media firm for everybody who's been Googling how to make a bomb. Okay. And that's the data that, that's the kind of world we're living in. Right. Or if there if there's a mishap that, that goes on, or if there is a, uh, something that goes on. Of course, the classic case is, is, is a guy, all of a sudden on the family computer was things about being pregnant. And he found, and his daughter was pregnant and nobody knew it, but he said, why am I getting all these messages about pregnancy? Well, she had been Googling everything about, about pregnancy. So therefore, the she herself was a sensor and everything was coming back to the house. So it'll be a lot of stuff. A lot of things we have to do about the law. We need to think about about the law as people uh, move around producing different kinds of data for themselves. And law enforcement will be right there because they also would be interested in finding, okay, who in Austin, Texas Googled how to make a bomb? Yeah. Yeah. Pretty well. Give me, give me, give me, give me a, give me a second, uh, Llewellyn. Hold on. Let me do my little commercial on Digital 360. So our annual conference is coming up uh, September 6th through 9th in 2022, uh, and uh, we're excited about what we did last year. And Restore Point Dave was in our uh, AI cloud panel. That was a fabulous panel with Amazon and many other players. Um, and, um, we are very excited about next year's conference and we want to thank Texas State University for, uh, sponsoring the digital round table. Llewellyn. Yeah, I was uh, wanted to take advantage Dave, of your telephone experience and inquire where is telephony going? Where are telephones going? Um, we know they're collecting data. We know that the cell phone is pretty well put
pushed out copper wire. Um, are the telephones going to be very different five years, 10 years from now? It's interesting because telephones won't be on desks anymore, right? Because, you know, it was interesting because we went from, you know, we went from traditional telephones, right, to voice over IP. Now even voice over IP, people are saying, well, why do I even need that? I have a cell phone, right? And the only issue on a cell phone is, is you know, keeping the personal apart from the business side, right? And and soon you'll have multiple phone numbers right on a given on a given instrument. And so I, I think the phones, I think what you'll see is the form factors of the phones will change, right? And you're starting to see that they're foldable, they're bendable, they have ones that you can roll up and put, you know, like they're using military technology where they're actually like a piece of plastic, you can put them in a backpack, right, for a kid. Um, so things are going to change in terms of the form factor. But, you know, the whole phone usage thing is I use my computer as my phone today. Right. I don't have a phone on my desk, right, any longer. And I have a cell phone if I actually need to talk to somebody. But I, I feel like the computer and the phone has completely merged. And it's interesting being at ATT, they had that vision when they bought NCR, right? Years and years and years ago. When ATT purchased NCR, they were saying the phone and the computer is going to come together. Well, they were a little early, right? In the 90s or whenever they made that acquisition. But you know, it's definitely going, that is all getting merged together. Voice and data is just becoming, you know, kind of one thing. And if you, if you look at our kids, they don't talk on the phone, right? They don't even message anymore in terms of, you know, texting. It's, it's more like a Snapchat or, you know, whatever is even quicker for them. But people that work for me that have children say that if I Snapchat my child, right, they'll respond to me. But if I send them a text, they won't, which I think is very interesting. So well, absolutely. The story is told that Llewellyn, asked his grandkids to hang up the phone. And they said, what do you mean by hang up the phone? <laughs> There's no such concept in their life as hang up the phone. But when you, you're, you're talking about unintended consequences, yes, you know, when I get the Samsung phone, it would become my computer because I would just get a keyboard to go with it. But let us not forget that the cell phone started as a safety device. Uh, and, and, and it was utilized as a safety device. In the early days of cell phones, people were saying that uh, people who had cell phones were running drugs and doing all kinds of stuff, right? And then a tree fell on somebody in, in Alabama and he said, if I had a cell phone, I would have my leg today. And all of a sudden, fathers can trace, could trace where their daughters were going and felt more secure as they went on dates. So let's, let's not forget that cell phones themselves started out as a safety device and, and therefore has evolved into this huge, humongous. And I don't know what we did before they were here. It's, it's I just, Llewellyn, I cannot remember how many little yellow pieces of papers and stickums I had and my big, <laughs> my big notebook. I mean, you know, I haven't been to a library. I didn't go to any library in the world on my computer. The world has changed so much. But Llewellyn would tell you, we need the human interaction moving forward. No matter I think how many we, cell phones we have, we're going to need the human interaction. If you don't allow for the human interaction, people feel left out and they join strange uh, organizations, cults, etc., which is a, a, a manifestation of this frustration that there is a technological world that has no space for them. I think we see it with its political manifestations too and the extremes of the political parties, for example. But um, not to hammer that, I read, Dave, that the uh, 5G is not getting the build out it was anticipated it would get, that the manufacturers are not making or investing in the hardware at nearly the rate it was anticipated, which uh, brings up the question, has it been totally oversold the way, say, the Segway was oversold as a means of transportation. You wonder because the the cell phone does it's the remote control for your life. I kind of think of it as right is the cell phone does all kinds of things. Right, it's my navigation now. It's my communication. It's it's many different things. Right, it has many, in fact you open your garage, your house. Right, you can do so many different things on a cell phone. The question I think people ask, or, or, or the promise of 5G is, is does it need to be faster? Not necessarily. Am I really streaming TV down to it? Maybe, maybe not, right? I mean, I think the cell phone today in the 4G environment does mostly what people want it to do, right? The average consumer. And there are applications for 5G, but I think for the average person, 
In fact, in, if you just look at how fast people are upgrading cell phones, it's now two plus years, right? If people are holding them much longer, when we got them free, no one cared. When you had to pay for them, now at three years is fine, right? Because the technology is good enough for all the use cases that we currently have. So then the question becomes, what is 5G really can, en what's it can enable? I think it'll enable the edge networking piece right, which will allow us to process more data at the edge of things, right, or at the edge of the cloud or the edge of the network. And again, it goes back to what I said earlier is moving data is the most complicated thing that we do. That's where security issues happen. That's where bottlenecks happen. That's why I need all this bandwidth. But what if I can actually analyze data and leave it where it is, bring it up in memory and be able to correlate things over the air? And that's where a 5G can really become very useful for us, right, um, in the cloud environment. Thank you. I'd like to direct the same question, if I might, at Andres, because Andres has been a very big proponent of 5G on this program. Yeah, I mean, I think that phones are headed into being embedded everywhere, and the user interface is not going to be you typing, but you speaking. So of, you know, uh, Siri, uh, Cortana, uh, Alexa. This is the beginning of the next user interface. It will be very prolific uh, and very intelligent in how, you know, you, I don't know how many of you, for example, uh, uh, dictate to your phone instead of typing into your phone. My wife does it all the time and she has, you know, over the years, and she's been doing that now for three or four years, the tools have gotten better and she's very quite proficient at it and, and, and it works for her. So, so I think at some point the phone will be, you know, embedded on us. It may end up being a receptacle like Captain Kirk saying, beat me up, Scotty kind of thing, very small, very thin, uh, but really connected to all this compute and all this sensory everywhere. And the and it is and it's really your 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 you know sort of your identifier. It also is you know the the way for people to track you with GPS and all these things. So it really has a survival and the same original safety purpose of finding you when you get lost. And, at what and, point? At what point will John have to retire his domestic servants? <laughs> Uh, I, don't know, I don't know that John will well, let me, get rid of that. <laughs> let me ask the question in another way, Dave, uh, for my distinguished uh, English, 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 well, for my distinguished colleague. Dave, what do you think is, what, what did this do for employment in your sector? So we've talked about how unemployment might evolve as a result of new technologies, as we always do. But as you see your the server or the, excuse me, the cloud system evolving. How you look at employment, is it gonna enhance employment in the sector? Is it gonna cut out? Is it gonna make mean that we fire more people? Is there a new industry evolving, maybe around secrecy, maybe around privatization? How do you see in the future, you know, going five to 10 years, what impact would this have on employing people? Are data scientists more relevant now than scientists? Yeah, How think, do you see this going forward? I, I think automation is going to happen everywhere, right? And as, as labor rates go up, I mean, think about it. You go into a McDonald's now, right? What happened? They put a kiosk in there, right? To order your own food, where, right? It's, eventually, the robots will make the food, right? And I, I just think you're going to see automation accelerate over the next 10 years like we've never seen before. And so the job creation will be in those folks that can program the automation, Right. And in order to be a programmer, you know, and so I have a math degree, I have a computer science degree, right? In order to be a programmer, you got to be proficient at data, right? And logic. And so we've got to get people back into the sciences because that's where the jobs are going to be in this country or in this world, right? Um, those that can, that have that, any of the logics, right? It could be an engineer, it could be a mathematician, it could be a computer science, but any of those advanced, right? Um, technical degrees are going to be what we need. The problem is, is the lower end jobs are the ones that are going to go away, right? And that's that's what that's what I get frightened over is, you know, those day in day out jobs are going. Look at Walmart right now. You can only do self checkout. They're going nationwide with it, 
So then I and then I look at it and say, well, what, so now they only take credit cards. Well, what about the underbanked people that, that shop at Walmart today? They don't have a credit card, right? So now you're not going to take cash. So you're going to see this change happen where you know we haven't even seen the ramifications of what that looks like. But I think as labor rates go up and inflation goes up, automation goes sky high. And I think yeah, I we're going to automate everything. And I do think that those degrees, if you look at econometrics in economics and statistics and sociology and psychology, as a professor, I know they lead in statistics. So statistics is, I'm not actually math undergrad, statistics is not mathematics. Mm -hmm. uh, it, is, it, is a, it is a way of thinking about the world and the normal curve. And I've always said, and you heard it here, Dave, I don't know what to do with the normal curve anymore since I'm not estimating parameters. <laughs> so I utilize the normal curve for sampling. Why should I have a sample? I can have a, an end now of 10 million if I wanted to. So what does, what does the normal curve tell me and regression toward the mean tell me about what's being significant and what's not significant? So one thing is that we're going to rethink how we do statistics, not necessarily mathematics. And I think that Econometrics and in, in, uh, economics and statistics and sociology and psychology, and to an extent, edge psych, would be a great tools to have going forward from college. Yeah. And then yeah. just some plain common sense, because remember, most of the people who created the great companies dropped out of college. <laughs> I, I think Johnny is absolutely right. I'd just like to parenthetically mention, Dave, because I'm glad you raised it. The government estimates there are 41 million unbanked people. Um, and I was, <clears throat> if Walmart goes exclusively, they, they will have to lose business or some other form of banking, some very low end banking, which will do the job because the unbanked, uh, their main use of banks is to cash a check uh, or to expatriate dollars, which very many uh, immigrants do. And it's yeah. an expatriate. Expensive. Yeah, this is where this is where cryptocurrencies fill in, and, and and there are many reasons why cryptocurrencies will emerge and and real and get realized. So don't be surprised if Walmart follows uh, their their uh, deployment of self checking with their own cryptocurrency. Uh, they would be issued and could give it to somebody by giving them sort of like a credit card size ID uh, and, and it gets, you know, it, it gets, uh, it, you know, deposited there and Walmart has the mechanism to do it. And you come to Walmart to recharge it uh, and, and it's not to do with the banks. It's just Walmart doing it and Walmart is the creditor and Walmart is the lender and, and Walmart is going to lend you money because they know who you are and they know what you kind of thing. Yeah, I also think something that's coming, you know, I was consulting for a major insurance company and we wrote every, we underwrote everything. That meant that we could choose our customers. I think it'll come a time when I walk into a store and give them my credit card and they'll say, I'm sorry, we can't take your credit card. You can't be, a, you cannot be a customer here. And the reason is your credit is so bad. And, uh, and the credit card companies have decided to jettison you off and we can't use it anymore. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's a possibility we have so much data that customers now would be able to underwrite all of the customers that they really want? Sure. Uh, insurance does this now. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, airlines uh, can do this now. And so not only is just that they don't have a credit card, but the data are so interesting that the merchants can see you coming when you walk into the store. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. This is the essence of my thesis on uh, the personal data economy and how I, we solve poverty and and um, and get rid of the cat and you know the, the need for cash where a human being generates you know twenty terabytes of data a year and the cost of a, a megabyte of data is twenty five dollars and um, and so anybody can you know just. I'm going to give the data on my heartbeat. I'm going to give the data on my blood flow. I'm going to give the data on my cancer situation that I have. And I'm going to sell all this data for research purposes or what, what have you. And, and that's how I make money. 
But will you be able to withhold any of this data if you don't want I, I, people? If you don't want people to know that you've got cancer, or you don't want people to know you have heart arrhythmia. Do you want that broadcast to the world? Well, yeah, I, I think I think what's going to happen is that we're going to have just you know today we give our data away for free to Facebook and Google and others, and I think that we that that world's going to change dramatically, and there will be some open source government act uh, containers of data where they're policy based and you, the customer, will control and determine who has access to your data and how it gets subscribed to and also how you get paid for sharing your data at any level. This yes, is Lurel, Lurel, remember that people, they are not as sick. I mean, this generation, as I tell my college students, stop throwing up on Facebook because the people were trying to and getting drunk on Facebook because when people hire you, that will be out there, believe it or not. People post when they have these horrific diseases now. People, <laughs> people post when they move around the world and then people go rob their houses. They would say, well, I'm on vacation and, and I left the house along and you know, it's data for the robbers. So you're right, it's, it's, it's a very interesting world that we live in. Luella <laughs> knows things that we wanted to keep secret years ago it's now public, as I like to tell my student, whatever happens in Las Vegas will be on social media. I have been now looking Las at, Vegas ends up on social media. I want to ask Dave a very simple question. If you were to walk into a room with people who did not know anything about data and its, its current uh, uh, importance, how would you describe data? I mean, how would you say what it is? I'm going to describe what it is. Um, it, it's a piece of, well, it's not information yet, right, until I correlate it with something else. So to me, it's just, you know, it's it's a standalone, just, it's a standalone item, right, that can be aggregated with other items to create information, right? And so to me, a piece of data is nothing more just like a sensor, right? It's something that just, it's a blip of, it, it's a blip of, of information, right, that has no association with anything. But, you know, I think that, I think one of the things, like when you think about Facebook and all of these things is when people are young, they didn't, so when Facebook came out and people were young, they didn't care about putting their data out there because they had nothing to lose. But as you get older and you have assets, right, you become more protective of your data. And the problem is, is they've left such a, such a trail behind them of just, you know, all bits of data, right, that now people can aggregate together you know, as, as a group or as an individual, right? It's become very, that's a big problem for a lot of young people that I they have understand. not protected it. I would, I, would, I would define it like this, Luan, and I, I, I would say data is the footprints of our existence. Some of it is created by me. Some of it is created by the weather. Some of it is created by the collective, but it's really the footprints that we leave behind as we, move through the journey of living. I think I that's very that, good. It's very useful. You could also say it's God's gift to divorce lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say, I would say the data are, and it's plural, data are plural. I would say yeah. that data are the sum total of the information that we need that stands alone outside of our consciousness. Yeah. That is, that's, that's, you know, why that's so important is because if we collect data in the wrong kind of data, this is why we do sampling, then we can make faulty conclusions. So we can go back in the 1930s when we had a person run for president and all the wealthy people had telephones and they polled them and they said, well, this person is going to win. Well, the data would say it was biased. So and the interesting thing about the data that we have now, we have taken all of those notions of bias out because there's so much of it. Before it was like, Andres, when, when mama cooked the cake, she cooked a little sample at first, right? And then you ate the sampler because the cake would be just like that. That means the parameters were correct. But with so much data now, mm -hmm. all those statistical st uh, tools are, so, are going out of the way. Interesting stuff. Let me, let me, let me finish with the following. Since we got a few more minutes, but I want to I wanna get... Uh... Uh, 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 find, uh, some thundering from Dave. So Dave, I hire you 
I, 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 you know, I believe you. I fall in love with what you're doing for me. My company's getting better. Give me a sense of the KPIs that you show me on how you're succeeding to help me. Is it higher sales? Is it lesser cost? Is it more productivity? What are those numbers and what are the percentages of having restore point on my team versus not? I mean, I think it depends. And one of the things is, you know, a lot of folks have said, you know, we got to focus on an industry, but since we're cross industry, you know, those, those KPIs depend. Um, I think our Georgia tech example is a good one since we've got some professors here is so Georgia tech uses us for their athletics, right? And we're doing softball and basketball right now. And so the whole concept is, is that all of their athletic departments can use our platform to ingest data, right. From, from, from different sources. But, it, but it's interesting. So we did the baseball team first. And so they wore vests. I put a sensor on the bat. And then the, and then we had cameras behind the mound to pitch. And the whole concept was that, you know, based on this torque speed or whatever, right on the body, I can see based on how fast they swing the bat and where the pitch is, we can predict where it's going to go. And Georgia Tech sold it to their recruits as you will be a better athlete if you come to Georgia Tech because of our, our analytics. Right. And their measurement was we will win an ACC championship, right, in the baseball team if we can go do that. Right. So that's kind of an easy example of, mm -hmm. you know, how simple, right. But, you know, that's what they're using it for. And they're using it across the different sports teams. And the analytics are different, obviously, depending on, right, depending on the game. Um, and I think that's pretty good. But as an LSU boy, we're just waiting for the University of Georgia to mess it up. <laughs> they always mess it up. I don't know how many analytics they have. They will go and they will lose to Wahoo University. And we're just praying that Georgia hope is looking them in the face and they're just wondering when they're going to mess it up. Finally, finally the human dimension has come to that. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. So all Georgia have all those great teams. I love their heart. My Tigers went over there 19 and beat them to death in Georgia. But you make an interesting point because it, it's being applied to baseball now. It's being applied to football. It's being applied to, you know, driving of cars. And in football, they have all these analytical people that are hired for $80,000. So understand that that is good, but make sure you call, go to Athens and give them all the analytics they need so they won't mess up the SEC like they used to be. Because my Tigers, LSU, they have taken a break this year. We're trying to let somebody else uh, have a great season. <laughs> Dave, thank you for being with us today. It's thank you, Dave. Very thank enlightening. You. Thank right. you very much, Dave. Very interesting. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. John, John, take us away. Georgia, oh my sweet Georgia, the whole, whole day through, just an old sweet song keeps Georgia on my mind. Excellent. Thank you Absolutely. very much, Johnny. Thank you. Thanks, Dave, John. thank you very much for being with us. All right. I appreciate the opportunity, guys. Okay, you take talking. care. All right.